Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to The Main Phase, a Magic the Gathering podcast aimed at bringing you the best content, period. This is episode 112. Today we talk about cards we like in standard, what we're seeing in the meta, and things that are just getting better. Stay tuned. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to the main phase episode 112. This is Jeremy and I am joined by my heterosexual life partner, Debo. Hey guys, how you doing today? Hey Debo, how you been this week, man? I've been great. You know, we've been playing a lot of, a lot of standard online, a lot of standard at the shop. Yes. And I got to say, we've been having a lot of fun with it. Ravnica Allegiance is an incredibly powerful set. Yeah, there's a lot of great cards in it. What's going on with the pricing? Let's start off with that. It it seems to me like, you know, systematically since Kaladesh block, as as blocks, new new sets come out, rather, right? Uh, Guilds of Ravnica seemed like it was a little hiked in price just for acquiring singles. But specifically Ravnica Allegiance, because of the power creep that it represents, because of uh, just the intangibles, there's not much that's really known about it, but we have a lot of cars that have yet to be built around. The pricing for just singles seems to be through the roof. Yeah, at at least in particular the new singles. Not necessarily the old ones. I haven't seen a whole lot of the old ones spike in price. Uh, If anything, they've actually kind of dipped a little bit. I'm specifically talking about Ravnica Allegiance. Yeah, Ravnica Allegiance... There were a couple of cards that, that dropped in price uh, from it. However, on the most part, they've they've held their pre-release pricing pretty well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, talk about Judith, right? Yeah. So Judith was what a two dollar card. Two dollar card. Yeah. Now, now she's eight fifty. Yep. Huge price hike on her. Really going up there. The Scargon Hellkite. You know, I understand that it's uh, it's a riot. You know, three colorless, two red for a four four dragon with riot. It's got a plus one plus one counter on it. You can. Spend three colorless and a red to deal two damage to any target. It's basically Glorybringer light, mm-hmm. right? It's not as effective as a Glorybringer in terms of creature control, right? But it is still a mean, nasty dragon. Yep. And when you start coupling things like Rhythm of the Wilds, I, here I won't get off track, but anyway, the pricing seems to me to be a little bit higher. Yeah, I, I mean, even like with like Bedevil, right? Yeah. Bedevil is just a good removal spell. Yeah. And I mean, it's fetching a pretty pricey price right now as well. So, you know, the the, the power level in the set is very good for standard. It's kind of mediocre for modern. It seems kind of decent for commander. There's a lot of good commander cards in the set. Yeah. And so I, I think that um, that overall, kind of hard to determine exactly what people should do with, with, their, with their money right now, because you don't want to necessarily wait for the next big deck to hit, and then everything spikes to like 40 bucks. Right. When you got something that's currently sitting at $4, maybe we should be fleshing it out. Hint, hint, Incubation Druid. Yep, yep. Hint, that hint. is definitely one that is about four and a half, five dollars $5 right now. If you don't got a set of those, go pick them up. It's worth the $20. Yep. But then we also don't want to have, you know, somebody spend 10 bucks on a card. Like let's say Judith. Maybe Judith really isn't the, the bee's knees, but everyone thinks she is. And so they, they're, they're paying a premium right now, and then she drops down to like a dollar in, in just a, a couple of weeks. I mean, when most sets fall out of standard anyway, most of the newest sets, I think that the rares and mythics that aren't absolutely game-changing... Uh, like Prime Speaker Vanifar. But, you know, the ga- the cards that aren't absolutely game-changing, they tend to level back up. I don't want to start this off uh, on a negative note, though. I think I feel like talking about price is always something that's a sensitive subject. You know, if you're an avid collector and an avid player of paper magic, it's one of the things that you understand. It is a hobby. Uh, hobbies require money. Did you crack any packs? I did. I opened two boxes. Me too. Set. Two boxes. Mm-hmm. Yep. And my first box got about five mythics. Nice. Yep. Uh, nice. A little bit above the uh, the curve there. Uh, second box was kind of right about four mythics. Yeah. I didn't really see uh, some of the best cards in the set, which, which kind of is a little surprising. Yeah. Um, like I didn't see the um, the ooze. I didn't see the ooze at all. Um, I, did, I have I, zero ooze as well. Yep. I uh, didn't see any Kaya. I saw a single planeswalker out of two boxes, and that was uh, Dove and Bond. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So I, I posted this on Twitter, but it definitely seems like there was some sort of a rarity thing going on with Skewer the Critics. Yeah. I feel like that card should have been printed at Uncommon. Yeah, and and it seems like its print run felt like more like an Uncommon than it did a Common. Out of two boxes, two booster boxes, I pulled five copies yeah, of I, Skewer the Critics. I think I pulled... Six Seven total. Yeah. But considering all the other commons are like 20. 
Yeah. Each. <laughs> it's kind of like, okay, well, I guess you, you really didn't want us to pull the secure of the critics. I mean, it really felt to me also my two boxes. And of course, it could have been just two boxes. I got one box from a totally different shop, so it was a different case. I got another box from a totally different shop, different case. But I pulled a lot of shock lands. I did not. I, I, I did not need the shock lands. <laughs> You've been playing a lot longer than you I know, have. So yeah. I, but I, it was a, you know, it was interesting to see the spread out of the cards. But hey, mm-hmm. listen, today I wanted to kind of jump into something. We had been kind of kicking this around. I figured it would be great if you and I spent some time on episode one twelve here, talking about what we believe the best cards in standard are. There might be some gotchas out there that you'd like to talk about. Mm-hmm. There might be a couple cards that you've been brewing around. Uh, but let's just, as we break into this new set, kind of spitball some ideas for our listeners here. So one of the best cards I think is in standard right now is actually an uncommon. It's Consecrate Consume from Orzhov. And uh, I think it's a perfect sideboard card for that guild. You have, you have for Consecrate, one and Orzhov for exile target card from a graveyard draw card at instant speed. And then on the other side, you have Consume, which is two white and a black. And then target player sacrifices a creature with the greatest power among creatures they control. And you gain life equal to that creature's power. I mean, talk about a great answer for Carnage Tyrant. Yeah. Right? Specifically. Yeah, specifically Mm -hmm. Carnage Tyrant, where you're looking at these control decks that spin in green to be able to drop a hexproof 7-6 that often eats everything else on your opponent's side of the board. Yep, especially in a guild like Orzhov that has a lot of 1-1s and 2-1s and 2-2s. I mean, it is is the answer when we're asking our opponent to sacrifice it. Yep. Right? We're not targeting anything. And I think that that is what that card is trying to do. Yep. Is give us an edict-style effect for the board to be able to clip those big nasties yep imagine hitting like a galta oh yeah it's beautiful now all of a sudden you gain 12 life and they sacrifice their galta it's beautiful yeah it is a beautiful beautiful thing and it really is the answer to the big dinos uh this last friday night magic i took a gruel deck what did you take i took rakdos burn oh rakdos burn you posted that last friday i did yeah Mm -hmm. how did that work out for you um i went two and two not bad yeah not bad i think i need to tweak it just a little bit um, it, it really kind of hurts against control. Yeah. My first matchup was against niv Mizzet control. Oof. And that's rough when the majority of your spells are instants and sorceries. Yeah. So I, I just wasn't able Trigger, to. Trigger, draw a card. Yeah. Trigger, draw a card. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's horrible. So I just wasn't able to, you know, get past that. Yeah. I also failed against Gruul, uh, yeah. Gruul aggro. I think I that one should have been a better matchup than it was. However, I... I kept a really greedy first hand where it was a bunch of red one and two drops mm-hmm. and then a swamp. <laughs> and um, I know I I shouldn't have kept it, but it's like, man, if I pull that one mountain red source and it didn't come. And it did, it, it, I didn't draw a single land in, until the very end of the game. I it's took so, a red green <laughs> rhythm of the wild deck and it ended up doing OK. I also went two and two, uh, but the uh, the game played interestingly i mean rhythm of the wild is an incredibly powerful enchantment yeah right all of our creatures gain haste if a null hide ferox could be better give it haste it, right it is obnoxious when i have two rhythm of the wilds in play i'm making it a seven seven and giving it haste and gruel spellbreaker backed up by its own riot trigger as well as two riot triggers from the rhythm of the wilds say because most of the time i had two in play right right by mid game uh, it was really something to behold you know, mm-hmm. Steel Leaf Champion with two Riot Triggers. Give it a plus one, plus one counter, and it can't be blocked by creatures uh, with power two or less. Amazing. It was a fun deck, but Gruul really, I don't think, is strong without the blue. You need the blue right now. I think mm-hmm. Teamer is coming back in a big way. Do you remember those times back in the Kaladesh block where Teamer Energy was running rampant? Mm-hmm. I think what's going to happen here is you're going to see massive ramp Teamer decks running Star of Extinction and Hydroid Crisis really really dominate yeah. the standard meta and then i could even see something like that the new dragon scargan hellkite yeah yep. seeing uh kind of like a replacement for the glory bringer in that style of deck because glory bringer was all in teamer energy yeah right? everywhere yeah so I, I could definitely see something like that being pieced back together with the hellkite being that glory bringer stand in yeah, and let's think about Scargan Hellkite with the Biomancer's Familiar. Remember the 2-2 two, two for a blue and a green mm-hmm. that reduces the abilities of creatures by two colorless? Yep. If you have two of those in play, you it's are literally red. casting shocks. Yep. Shock, shock, shock. It is brutal 
how effective that card is. I don't think, I think we would be remiss if we didn't close out our quick discussion about Friday Night Magic and then really dive into the cards that we're interested in here for Standard uh, without talking about that Saltai Ooze deck that we saw floating around. Oh my God, yeah. Listen, Biogenic Ooze is the real deal. That card is, in terms of just strength and how effective it is deserving of its price tag right now, especially if you're playing any type of competitive magic. When you talk about putting it into a soul tie shell and you're running incubation druids and you're running Vraska's contempt and you're running find finality and you're running all of these really nasty capable cards like ravenous chupacabra, like Vraska, like I don't really know what to say beyond soul tie ooze is a real thing and it is coming strong. There is probably uh, no stopping that deck. It is an incredibly powerful card. And when you get the blue into that Golgari mix, you sprinkle in the, the ooze. The ooze becomes a token generator that just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Uh, but when you spink, sprinkle the blue in, you've now got the ability to say no. Mm-hmm. Right? And being able to say no in competitive magic in any way is so much more important than people give it credit for. Of it, course, professional magic players obviously give it credit. For. Right. And, and what's great about the ooze, too, is since it, it has that activated ability of one green, 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 mm-hmm. to be able to create another 2-2 two, two ooze, being able to hold up your mana for that counter spell, and then if they don't have an answer to it, you just, okay, well, I'll pump in four mana. Get right at their two, end two. step. Yep. That's right. Right at their end step. So I, I think... it. I, that ooze is very strong. You need to take care of it right away. Yes. And, you know, if you if you talk about, you know, Black obviously has the best sideboard answers in the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, the ability to disrupt the hand, to exile creatures and planeswalkers. Thought Erasure certainly has a place in competitive magic right now. And then don't forget, we also still have cards like Search for Azkanta. Oh, yeah. Which just, okay, well, I'm going to put that creature into my graveyard, and I know I'm going to get it back later with Find. That's right. I mean, something like that could just be brutal. Yeah. Find's the real deal, too. That mm-hmm. card's been seeing a lot of standard play. I don't think Golgari's going anywhere, but I think that uh, Sultai is definitely coming on strong. Sultai and Teamer are going to make mm-hmm. an impact, I think. And maybe Mardu Humans, too, if they can figure out a way to reliably curve that out. Yeah, you know what I think Mardu Humans needs? What's that? I haven't really been seeing it. It needs uh, the top end of Gruesome Menagerie. Oh, yeah, it does. Because then well, all That's a great idea. Then all all of a sudden you get a one drop, a two drop, and your Judith back. What does Gruesome Menagerie do? So Gruesome Menagerie is three black black. You may return from your graveyard. That's a sorcerer. You may return from your graveyard a one drop, a two drop, and a three drop. Yeah. To your hand or the battlefield? Uh, To the battlefield. To the battlefield. Yeah. So a lot of people were like, well, why would I ever want this card? Yeah. Well, Judith is a reason why you want this card, right? I mean, Heroic Reinforcements won the Pro Tour, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's an uncommon two colorless, a red and a white. You put two soldier tokens, one one soldier tokens into play, and creatures you control get plus one, plus one in haste until the end of turn. Mm-hmm. Judith makes that unacceptably bad with Hero yeah. of Precinct One as well, where any multicolor creatures that you're dropping, it's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. Dude. One of my next decks that I'll be posting myself is going to be actually a Jund aggro list running Judith in there. Oh, good. And so. One of the things I was thinking was like Pelt Collector and Vyashino, Pyromancer, Judith, and then we could also be running like Legion Warboss, uh, Gutter Bones. Oh, dude, Legion Warboss and Gutter Bones is fantastic in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good call with that. That's and, beautiful. And then all of a sudden you have uh, like with your, if, let's say you have your Judith already out and you top deck your Menagerie. You better be running Siege Gang Commander in this deck. <laughs> I was actually thinking about the Thorn Lieutenant. Yeah. And the Ooh, Growth Chamber Guardian. Thorn Lieutenant. Mm-hmm. awful in there Ugh. and then you can even consider running main or sideboard the rhythm of the wilds to fight off counter control and then also give everything haste so so imagine this you have rhythm of the wilds in play and then you top deck your your gruesome menagerie you cast that you get back a pelt collector a Vyoshino Pyromancer pumping your Pelt Collector and then say a Judith and then you swing in every th- and, and they all get plus one plus one counters riot and you swing in with haste or something wow. like that wow yeah. That is fantastic. Yeah. I can't wait to see that. Okay. Let's dive into some cards that are really starting to kind of take standard by storm here. And I'm going to go over some of the ones that I think are a little underrated. We've been having some internal conversations about this uh, particular card. And you had some really good ideas with it when we were talking about a blue-green fish deck just a second ago. Uh, But walk me through Benthic Biomancer. 
Sure. So Benthic Biomancer is, in my opinion, the one drop that Merfolk really needed. Yeah. One so blue for a 1-1. One, one. Exactly. And it has adapt one and a blue mm-hmm. for, for adapt one for one and a blue. Yeah. And it says whenever a plus one, plus one counter is put on Benthic Biomancer, you may draw a card. And then if you do discard a card. Loot. Yep. So now imagine that with Deep Root Elite. Wow. So Deep Root Elite is one in the green for a 1-1. One, one. Whenever another Merfolk enters the battlefield, put a plus one, plus one counter on a Merfolk you control. And guess what Benthic Biomancer is? What's that? A Merfolk. It's a Merfolk. <laughs> so, so all of a sudden you, you play your Deep Root Elite and then command a speaker and then you can put a plus one plus one counter on your biomancer it doesn't matter if it already had a counter on it you still get to draw a card and discard a card so you're fixing your hand and you're getting more of the answers that you need and getting rid of the lands you don't so i I think that card definitely has a place in merfolk and it, it should it should be run alongside the jade bearer command a speaker benthic biomancer Jade Light Ranger. Jade Light Ranger. Merfolk um, Explorer. Yep. The uh, Merfolk Branch, Branch Walker. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, Deep Root Elite. Merfolk Explorer. That's what it does. <laughs> yeah. It's everybody's favorite friend. Also, main board, you'd want to be running Shaper Sanctuary uh, because there's a lot of targeted removal right now. And then in your sideboard, you can be running the Deep Root Waters for, for up against control matchups. So that way, even if they counter your creature spell, you still get a 1-1 with Hexproof. Nice, man. Yeah. So I think, I think it's definitely got some legs right now. But you have to build it right, yeah. And, and you have to build it with with the the right support spells. You've absolutely got to build it correctly. Kumana's mm-hmm. in there, right? Um, maybe as a w- one or two, just supplemental. Yeah. Okay. I don't think the fish deck will, will be good enough if you're trying to rely on Kumana. Right. I think it'll fish all... decks need a Kumana deck needs to be a Kumana deck, right? Right. Okay. I, I think for for a fish deck to survive right now, it needs to be very low to the ground and very aggressive. Very very fast. Yep. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm talking 18 to 20 lands and ways to dig through your deck to find your creatures. Curious and, Obsession and make it into that deck? Maybe. But they have unblockable Merfolk. Yeah, they, they do. Um, this Cloaked Herald is a one drop, one, one, can't the, be blocked. The problem is, is I don't know if in the fish deck, if the Mist Cloaked Herald is going to be good enough for okay. you to be able to want to run it. I see. Instead, I would probably rely more on Mist Binders to lord them. Yep. You're going to be dropping the two drop Lord. Yep. Right. Okay. I mean, imagine, imagine with the Kamena speaker, you drop the misbinder, then all of a sudden you're swinging with a three, three gun turn one. Yep. Right. And then if you have deep root elite, turn two. Uh, oh, turn two, yeah. excuse me. And then you have a uh, deep root elite out. And then, so you're able to play deep root elite, cast your biomancer, put a counter on your biomancer to then draw a card and discard a land. Right. So now you're starting to churn through your deck. You have incubation incongruity. So that way you can dig five deep to find an, an, the next creature. That's right. Right. Yeah. And you have an answer for their big baddie that, the, that they're going to drop like Lyra or the, uh, exactly. Yeah. So you also have adventurous impulse to allow you to dig three deep to find a creature or a land. And if we're running so light on lands, that's going to be really helpful for something like that. So I think that's the direction like Merfolk needs to be kind of like what goblins is or burn is in modern. Right. Where it I has think you're that, right. That has that eight, lands and there's nothing but creatures I think people try to go too wide mm-hmm. with it you know like and, tempest caller is tempting yeah but it's in my opinion productive yeah my opinion it's too it's too expensive for the the power level it's in standard right now merfolk needs to stay under three mana on all their spells okay i mean i'm down with that i just want to touch on gruel a little bit there's an uncommon that i didn't include as my four drop of choice but i think the four drop of choice for gruel going forward is definitely going to be sunder shaman Uh, this uncommon's great right it harkens back and it immediately reminds me of a five five for four mana what what card do you think of Debo? Juzam Jin, that's right. So Juzam Jin, uh, <laughs> Juzam Jin is a, a four four. It's totally didn't get that. <laughs> it, it's a five five for four. It deals you a damage on your upkeep, right? Uh, Juzam Jin certainly had its time dominating magic gameplay, right? It's an incredibly expensive and still a very powerful card. But, you know, Gruul, I think running a, a Phoenix or Rekindling Phoenix at four is fine. I think running a Nullhide Ferox at four mana is just fine. But they're both, and those are both less difficult to cast than a Sunder Shaman. But Sunder Shaman specifically with Rhythm of the Wild, Hadana's Climb, and Wilderness Reclamation might just be the type of card that eats the best best artifacts and enchantments your opponents have with Rhythm of the Wild. And I think it's something really, really great and really, really powerful in a Riot deck that doesn't want to be suppressed by cards like Ixalan's Binding. So the the next card that's on my list, we have something to say about a really powerful elf deck in in the standard right now. So we, we, you know, we have Pelt Collector. We have the Elvish Clan Caller that that buffs all of our elves. Plus it can tutor up another copy and put it directly in the battlefield. Oh, yeah. 
You know what else is an elf that can tutor up another copy of itself? Uh, Growth Chamber Guardian. Oh, yeah. That's right. <laughs> so for one and a green, we get a 2-2. Two, two, so it's already a bear, which is great. And then it has the plus on it that is adapt two for two and a green, right? So now we get to have a 4-4 four, four for two, which is great. Yeah. And then whenever a plus one, plus one counter is placed on it, we get to tutor up another copy of it and put it directly into our hand. Wow. Yeah. So, and then we also have Thorn Lieutenant, which is another real quick one in a green for a two, three that can buff itself. And if it gets targeted with something, you get a, another one, one. So we have these, these beautiful things and imagine that with Rhythm of the Wilds, right? So now for one red and green, we get an enchantment. Again, we, our creatures can't be countered and then they can either come in with a plus one, plus one counter or haste. So imagine we're playing an elf ball deck and we just get to go through all of our elves because we have so much mana. What's the four drop from Guilds of Ravnica that got us the... Uh, Beast Whisperer. Beast which is, Whisperer. Which is also an elf. Fantastic. <laughs> right, right. So we're talking about big time elf ball there. Yeah. And then the now all of a sudden they come down with haste. I mean, that's that's crazy. Or in the, in the instance of Growth Chamber Guardian, maybe we want him to come down with a plus one, plus one counter. And you're talking about... To be able to tutor up another copy. And elf. elves do a really great job of generating mana. Mm-hmm. Right? We've, yep. got, we've got a couple druids. It, we also have Lanowar elves. Yeah, Lanowar elves. We've got Druid of the Cow, mm-hmm. Druid of the Cal is able to generate mana. Do you include Marwyn in this deck? I know that the previous elf ball before we got to Ravnica Allegiance definitely included Marwyn because you know, not only she was, was she a finisher type, but mm-hmm. she generated a tremendous amount of mana for us to be able to keep casting the elves that we needed. I, I would I would include a couple of her. Yeah, not, why not, right? Yeah, I mean, she, she's cheap enough. Uh, even an, another creature to maybe consider is Grand Warlord Rada. Yeah, for, absolutely. For two red and a green, she has haste natively. So You know what the best thing about including Rhythm of the Wild is with haste creatures that tap for mana? Well, I mean, you can just use them as soon as they come down. As soon as they come mm-hmm. down, we're doing that. Talk about being able to go even more explosive. But yep. I'm thinking about sideboard cards like Banefire. Mm-hmm. Like Electro Dominance. Which is great. Where we are talking about being able to do some really incredible stuff. Incredible stuff, in yeah. fact. Electro Dominance, if we were to... Oh my goodness. Debo, we could really make a green-red elf deck out of control. Completely out of control with Wilderness Reclamation. Mm-hmm. At the end, Electro Dominance casts something else free from our hand. Think about being... Oh my goodness. Well, okay. All right. That is a great idea. Mm-hmm. There is an elf deck and, that is coming. I agree. And imagine swinging in with the Grand Warlord Rada, being able to get a bunch of mana uh, due to her ability of whenever she and any other creature you control attacks, you get a red or green mana until the end of your turn. So now all of a sudden you're swinging in. If you have a, a Rhythm of the Wilds out, you have a 4-5 swinging in for, with haste along with your other creatures doing huge amounts of damage. And then you're getting a... a you're banking a ton of mana that you yeah. can then just bane fire or electric dominance at the end of your turn. Man, awesome. Yep. Just awesome. You know what? I'd like to see that deck list if I could maybe encourage you to get something wrapped up for that. And let's get that on the site so we can get some people's uh, top hats kind of floating a little bit with those ideas. Sure. I've got another card here that has really been off the radar, not getting much attention. I What's don't that? Feel. And that is Carnival Carnage. The Carnival side for one Rakdos is Carnival deals one damage to target creature or planeswalker and one damage to that permanence controller. That particular side of the card, when you're getting on and you're looking at all these teamer decks that are gaining traction, when you're looking at all of this Golgari decks that are gaining traction, the number one most played card in standard right now is what? Lanowar Elves. Yep. It is Lanowar Elves. We need a card like that at instant speed to tamp down and no-no green decks, right? But the carnage side of it is a harken back to a card that is incredibly powerful. And you never are upset to mid-game draw this. Carnage deals three damage to target opponent, and that player discards two cards. So it's a Blightning. Correct. It is two colorless, red-black, four Blightning. Yep. This card is not getting nearly enough attention. No, I agree with you. I think that that's really good. And in fact, that should arguably be in the sideboard of my Rakdos burn list that uh no question i can just imagine that right now against a lot of the control name is it control yep that yes. would have been great forcing them to discard cards board in four four copies of it cast yep. it they burn a counter so what but specifically uh, we need answers to land war elves because decks are taken off way too fast right now. and most of that is anchored on on the mana nerd themselves mm-hmm. what else you got um, so this card, I, I think this one is starting to see more more traction. And also it, it kind of goes back into that elf deck that we were talking about. Sure, sure. Incubation Druid. Okay. So Incubation Druid is one in a green for a zero two. Black Lotus. 
Yes. Yep. Tap right. add one man of, of any type that a land you control could produce. And then if it has a plus one, plus one counter on it, add three mana of any type that a land you could produce. And then for three green, green, you can adapt three. So That's you, right. So you just put three plus one, plus one counters on her. Now imagine you are playing like your elf ball deck and then you're able to, to get her out and you have a Rhythm of the Wilds in play. She now has haste. Optimally two copies of Rhythm of the Wilds so she gets haste and a plus one, plus one counter. Exactly. Attacks for three mana and casts another Incubation Druid and a Land of War Elf and they both come in, yeah. blah, 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 blah. And it just keeps going. Yep. Yeah. Light up the stage. You were all about this card when the set was yeah. first being spoiled. I, and I played it in Rakdos. I don't think it's getting enough attention. No, I, I agree with you. I was able to do some really busted things with this card on, on Friday. So I was, again, I was playing Rakdos Burn last Friday. And I had an instance where I had the Theater of Horrors in play. Yes, Theater of Horrors is perfect for this. Mm-hmm. I exiled the Light Up the Stage. Yep. I was able to Lightning Bolt my opponent. And then that was the last card in my hand. I then was able to, for spectacle, cast light at the stage, exile another light at the stage, and a um, skewer the critics. Yes. And then I was able to skewer the critics, light at the stage again, and then have another two cards ready to go. Like, this card is really good. Yeah. You know what else it makes me wonder is if there isn't actually a place for mono red burn style decks. Because a card I think everybody's kind of forgetting about with cards like Light Up the Stage uh, and Theater of Horrors, or I mean, even if you do go Rakdos with it and you include Theater of Horrors, but Flame of the Kel, yeah, it plays so well into this. You specifically red dies in those burn style decks when you flood, yeah, right. These cards help us stabilize, and you don't flood. An- it- another th- another thing that I think sh- can go into this as well, and I've been thinking about this a lot recently is not only can you be running your Light at the Stage and your Theater of Horrors, but in, in these decks, maybe we should consider running Experimental Frenzy. Sure. Because Experimental Frenzy doesn't allow you to cast things from your hand. Well, guess what Light at the Stage and Theater of Horrors do? It exiles. So we're not casting from our hand. Right. We're casting from exile. Yes, absolutely. So it, it just expands what we can cast. Yeah. Because that's, that's the biggest thing about Experimental Frenzy is you're only limited to only playing your top card. Only what is on the top of your library. So if right. all, now all of a sudden we have a, little, a few more options. That's right. I think that's what we could do. Another cool card that we could run in that is is that flip land. Um, the three and a red from Ixalan. I don't remember the name of it. I'm sorry. Um, but it says exile the top card of your library. And if you cast three spells. Vance's Blasting Cannons. That's it. Vance's Blasting Cannons. If you cast three spells, you can flip it. And then all of a sudden, it's a land that can do a bolt for uh, three and a tap. I mean, now we're talking about some really substantial stuff where the drawback then becomes how many damage dealing spells can we actually fit into the deck <laughs> right. when we're building in all this velocity, right? Mm-hmm. So the velocity can take place. There's a lot of, of real magic, if you will, that can occur and, here. And if we're starting to run too heavy of mana cost in a deck like this, well, then guess what we also have? We have Runaway Steamkin, oh, which, which can produce us three mana yeah. for the most of our stuff. favorite card yep. ever. <laughs> I mean, it's a good card. I'm not. I'm not judging you know, to each their own. <laughs> Minus thing in the ice, you know. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. That's a great. That's a great. It's actually not my favorite card ever. I don't even know what my favorite card ever is. That'd be an impossible question to answer. All right. Rant aside. Fireblade artist. Originally, we saw that in a community submitted deck that came into us from a Mardu list. Fireblade Artist, uh, in terms of low curve and Rakdos, or a 2 2 for haste that gives us the ability to sacrifice a creature, deal two damage to target opponent or planeswalker uh, on our upkeep. Should this be with Judith? This card should absolutely be with Judith. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you why. Mardu Humans with Hero of Precinct 1 is generating tokens. The Heroic Reinforcement generates tokens. Hunted Witness is at a 4 of in there. The Hunted Witness can be sacrificed. It replaces itself immediately to the Fireblade Artist, and we are gaining more traction. Keep in mind that the kill swing with Mardu Humans and Judith is the Heroic Reinforcements. Yeah, and another thing to consider with a deck like this is Gutter Bones. Which is Perfect. a one black, two one. Yep. Enters the battlefield tap, but whenever an opponent is dealt damage, you can pay one to black and return it from your graveyard to your hand. Absolutely. So now all of a sudden you're, you're, you play this and then you sacrifice your, your gutter bones to your fireblade artist. And then you're dealt, they're dealt three damage if you have a Judith in play. And then you can pay one to black and bring it back to your hand. And if you already have a Judith in play, then you have three mana to be able to, you know, get it back and, and play it again. Yeah, man, I was I was honestly thinking that those types of recursive threats, even re- reassembling El- Skeleton mm-hmm. uh, from M19 for a colorless and a black, it enters the battlefield tapped, uh, but it does 
come back at, at any time that we want to pay another uh, colorless and a black for it, that is another one of those creatures that we could sack off to the Fireblade Artist and bring it right back at the end of the turn. Another card that I actually, another card that I actually like in this style of deck, and it was posted in my my white black sack deck with Alinda and Tasa Karlov. Yeah, is Priest of Forgotten Gods. Yes. So for one to black, you get a one two that taps, and you can sacrifice another creature. And any number of target players, each sacrifice a creature they control, they lose two life, and you, you yourself add two black, and you draw a card. Can we break that card? Well, yeah. So if you if you think about it this way, you're you're playing that with gutter bones and or reassembling skeleton. Then all of a sudden, you're able to swing in. Uh, like let's say you have, you have the death baron, right? So you're swinging sure. in with um, plus one plus one and death touch. They're not going to want to block it. You deal the damage, and then you can tap your priest of forgotten gods, sacrifice your reassembling skeleton which is already tapped anyways they have to then sacrifice the creature that they didn't want to block with awesome and then uh they lose two life and then you gain two mana to get back your reassembling skeleton and you draw a card awesome that is incredibly powerful yeah wow death baron death baron death baron yep wow 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 okay so do you remember a card that was printed in invasion called mystic snake Yes. It was a colorless and a green and two blue. And you could play it at any time. You could play an instant mm-hmm. was the verbiage, which they've recently called what, Debo? Flash. Flash. And it flashed into the battlefield. And you did what when it flashed in? You countered target spell. So they printed in Ravnica Allegiance a card called Frilled Mystic. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a callback to Mystic Snake, right? But that got me thinking. Green, green, blue, blue, counter target spell, flash. That's mm-hmm. right. For a 3 2. For a 3 2. Mm-hmm. But. So it's stronger than Mystic Snake. Still the same converted mana cost, just a little harder to cast. Exactly. Just a little harder to cast. But it got me thinking when we were sitting around at Friday Night Magic, and we kind of got excited about this. What about Nikya of the Old Ways? Yep. She is perfect for a deck like this. Isn't that right? perfect? Yeah, because now you also have counter control. You have a flash creature that you can you can play with her. You, you're, you run Teamer with you her, right? You run Teamer, yeah. And and now we have a bunch of really great cards that we can play with her <laughs> that just kind of helps answer anything. Think about playing Frilled Mystic with Nikia of the Old Ways and leaving just two mana up. Mm-hmm. Your opponent is not expecting a hard counter. No, Least not. of all in the form of a creature. Exactly. That gets me really excited about trying to build around Nikki of the Old Ways. She is three colorless, a red and a green for a 5-5. Five five. You can't cast non-creature spells. She's a legendary centaur druid. Whenever you tap a land for mana, add one mana of any type that land produced. Being able to counter spells with creature cards is bonkers totally bonkers think about being able to cast the merfolk trickster for a single blue source from a land right we are talking about nikia a nikia deck with some extreme potential here anyway for your consideration i'd love to see a community submission come across with nikia the old ways what else you got for us okay so i have actually another green card that this one seems better in commander okay um but i think is could actually be pretty hilarious in standard let's see what you got it's called guardian project (laughs) <laughs> I do this. I open those in my boxes as well. Yeah. And I just kept thinking to myself, is it time for us to take a brawl deck to standard night? So for three and a green, you have an enchantment that says whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, if it doesn't have the same name as another creature you control uh, or a creature card in your graveyard, draw a card. Seems bad. Seems bad. However, okay. imagine this with something like the, uh, the Scrabbling Claws. That recently oh, got. I love that artifact, by the way. Yeah, so for one mana, you can tap, and then target player exiles a card from their graveyard. That's correct. Right? So now we're playing that with Guardian Project, and if we wanted, maybe we have something like Desecrated Tomb. <laughs> and then we play something like Prime Speaker Vanifar. Wow. And now we're all of a sudden, we're producing creatures to then be able to sack to Vanifar, to then uh, be able to, to get something out, draw a card because, you know, the, the creature goes you to the graveyard. You evil soul tie ways. And then the and then you have to be soul tie. It could be, g- be just green blue. It really could, to. yeah. However, then all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're starting to piece together a toolbox type of a thing. And if we run multiple copies of it, we just exile it away with the scrabbling claws to be able to, to get a bat. And then uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. we can also draw a card because it's not in our graveyard anymore. Too bad it's not a skeleton bat. I know, right? <laughs> Uh, but still, that's you're you're kind of going you're kind of going deep into the brewing hole for everybody here. But yeah. I, I like that a lot. That's actually pretty clever stuff, man. Thank you. So if if people are just kind of new joining us, I, I love building jank decks like that. Oh, so yeah. so that you'll definitely probably see something like that. He's from got me. a tattoo right above his belly button that says "I love jank." <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, you, you forgot JB. It's right. It's right above my. It's right in the small of my back. Right? It's, <laughs> I love Jank. Right. That's where it's at. It's on both sides. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. That's enough. All right. So, um, font of agonies is piquing my curiosity. It is one black for an enchantment. Whenever you pay life, that put that many blood counters on Font of Agonies. For a colorless and a black, remove four blood counters from Font of Agonies and destroy target creature. A reoccurring doom blade over and over it again. It is a reoccurring doom blade over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. Um, you can keep an Adanto Vanguard alive one time and then destroy a creature for two mana. Yep. The ability to be able to generate life off of those style vampire decks in an Orzov shell uh, is really quite profound, especially as you start getting into some of the lifelink tokens. You can recur a lot of that uh, that life that you're paying. And I just don't know that this card is as on the radar as it needs to be. Uh, Argel's Bloodfast really does turn into something pretty amazing and being able to draw tempo, place counters on the Font of Agonies and then use it as a Doomblade style effect. Uh, we we have just an incredible amount of opportunity to turn Font of Agonies into an excellent control uh, piece in any deck where we are paying life and gaining life back and forth. I just don't know if we have what it takes right now uh, to be able to piece this together in an effective way. But when I see cards like Font of Agonies, it immediately makes me think of the sets that are coming. I know we just got into Ravnica Allegiance, but it makes me wonder what three months down the road, six months down the road is going to give us in standard because cards like this, any one casting cost card in Magic that has the ability to destroy permanents, Uh, based upon something that you're doing organically with the way that your deck flows and the way that your deck is built, uh, has the potential to be incredibly powerful, okay? Uh, Cards like this, and what I've noticed about Font of Agonies, this is basically a bulk rare. It's everywhere right now. But I think that we're going to see more of this card, probably not right now, but definitely in the future. Okay, uh, what else you got, Debo? Any, any other cards kind of piquing your interest right now? I know you played Pestilent Spirit on Friday. How did that work out for you? I love that card. Do you? That that card is so good. I, I, I had a lot of instances when I was playing this card, specifically in Golgari Big Stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, I, you know, my burn spells aren't going to get there against a lot of Steel Leaf Champions, against Galta, that type of thing. So, you play your Pestilent Spirit for two and a black and then all your spells have death touch now all of a sudden you have an answer to some of these things that you can't deal with and especially if you run you know like a, a sweeper like uh, pirate clasm fiery cannonade well now all of a sudden you, you have a board wipe in your hand that you didn't have before but another thing too is if you have one and you're swinging in and all they have is big stuff well it just becomes another burn spell over and over and over Amazing. again yeah. and, and if you have two and you leave one up for blocks and you're swinging in with another one they're not going to want to block it. Nobody's blocking that. And so, <laughs> like, they don't want to lose two five fours to a three two. That's right. So they're going to wait and wait and wait for their for their answers for it, like Assassin's Trophy or something like that. Sure. But try to figure out a way to equitably remove it from the board. Right. Yeah. But if you hold back something like Wizard's Lightning or Lightning Strike, zap, and then they go to to uh, kill your Pestilent Spirit, well then yeah, you just zap their creature away. And you're like, okay, great. Hey, there we go. Take yep. three. <laughs> so uh, that card, that card was really good. Too I, bad we have to pass priority. <laughs> Jeez, I know. But <laughs> but no, that card is really good. I was hyped for it, and I'm still hyped for it. I think that card has a shot to be something really good. You know what? A card I don't think that anybody is really playing right now, or really kind of hyping much. But I think we're going to see it all over competitive standard, and I'm willing to stake my claim on this. What's that? Angel of Grace. Angel of Grace is a flash 5-4 for three colorless and two white. Angel enters the battlefield until end of turn damage that would reduce your life total to less than one, reduces it to one instead. Uh, And then for four colorless and two white, you can exile Angel of Grace from your graveyard. Your life total becomes 10. Selesnia Angels has not really taken hold yet, but a card like this makes it so that a deck like that can definitely take hold. Uh, angels are strong as they are. I went five Oh mm-hmm. with, uh, recently with a mono white angels deck and I would love to be playing this card. Yeah. Okay. okay. And when you talk about Selesnia, I'm talking about Naya angels. When we start getting into Naya angels with Aurelia, with Shalai, with rhythm of the wild, 
talk about the ability. Haste five five Lyra. What? Yeah. That's horrifying, right? We start really getting into some terrible Naya Angels is something that is not on the radar, that is incredibly powerful, gives us access to key enchantments, and make no mistake, folks, Rhythm of the Wild ain't going anywhere. That card's gonna be everywhere for a for the time being. Yeah. Okay. Dinos. Let's talk about dinos here for a second. You were just getting hyped about Rhythm of the Wild and Dinos. Yeah. Look at the potential there. What cards are you excited about in an Anaya Dinos deck? Okay, so uh, imagine your Siege Horn Ceratops. Oh my goodness, yeah. Nice, nice little two drop green. Everybody's and white. forgot about him. Right. So uh, the reason why is because he's a two two. He's a two. He's just a two two. Right. Well, he has an Enrage ability, which is really great. That says whenever it's dealt damage, put two plus one plus one counters on him. Yep. Well, if you have a Rhythm of the Wilds in play, at, or two, even better. But if you have one in play, now he's all of a sudden a three three. Right. Three threes are much better to block than a two two. Yes, they are. And so now all of a sudden he gets out of control like crazy. Yep. Right. So real he, fast. Five five seven seven nine nine eleven eleven. I mean, just huge. And then they have to then they have to burn the removal spell on him instead of something like Registar Alpha, right? Which all of a sudden is now a uh, four four with haste that produces a three three with haste, and that's the one that you want yep. to get, yep. right? It produces the three three with haste, but I'd bring the Regisaur in as a five five anyway. Just pop the plus one plus one counter on him, and then the rest of the diners are still swinging in haste. Um, imagine this with a, a Ripjaw Raptor. Absolutely. Now all of a sudden you can either have a um, a four five with haste that whenever it's dealt damage you draw a card, or you can have a five six. That is a much beefier thing to do blocking with. Let's talk trap jaw tyrant and dinosaurs. Let's yeah. just go straight Naya with it, right? Five five for three colorless and two white. It's got an enrage trigger that says whenever it's dealt damage, exile target creature your opponent controls until it leaves the battlefield. Amazing. Yeah. Let's talk about the temple altasaur, right? All of your di- all damage that would be dealt to dinosaurs you control is reduced to one. And you know what we could be running in this deck instead of. The, the old Spanish producer that we had. What's that? Incubation Druid. You could absolutely so, be doing that. Drop the Drover of the Mighty immediately. Yep. So now all of a sudden we're, we're playing the Incubation Druid and we're able to produce a ton more mana and we feel a lot better casting some of these bigger dinosaur spells that we didn't have wow. the ability to do before. I don't know that that's really been tapped just yet. Mm-hmm. Again, uh, maybe a brew we can put together, but swapping Incubation Druid for the Drover right? It's scary. Yeah. That's terrifying actually to be able to generate that much mana. Crazy. Anything else on your radar here? One card I think that gets better is Slaughter the Strong. This card hasn't really been seeing a lot of play, but for control decks, I think it's something to maybe consider for your sideboard. So it's one white white for a sorcery that says each player chooses any number of creatures with total power equal to four or less and then sacrifices the rest. So we, we've got... <laughs> We've got a, a bunch of things that, that can either come in with plus one, plus one counters, or they're just big, beefy dudes. So now all of a sudden, you know, we play something like Slaughter the Strong. Well, the only the only deck that, that you know, may really want to be running this, like, main, is something like uh, Orzov that has a bunch of 1-1s one and 2-1s and things like that. So you get to keep a board, and then you're playing against a bunch of uh, Golgari decks that have these 5-4s and, and uh, 12-12s. And they have to stack them all. Speaking of Slaughter the Strong, you know an enchantment that just was printed in Ravnica Allegiance that made me think of nothing but Slaughter the Strong and Tetsuko and Tilanali Summoner? High Alert. Not just, no, no, not High Alert. Uh, although that is one you should definitely discuss here in just a second. But mm-hmm. Cavalcade of Calamity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One colorless, one red, uncommon. Whenever a creature you control with power one or less attacks, Cavalcade of Calamity deals one damage Uh, to the player planeswalker that creature is attacking let me tell you something about running four copies of this card with one power creatures we've got that new one three in blue that was just printed whenever it deals combat damage to a player you draw a card we've got tetsuko which makes your one ones unblockable we've got tilanali summoner which with enough mana puts one ones with haste in play that can't be blocked when you swing in with tilanali summoner it produces you could pay x and a red produce one one elementals uh, that are swinging in and it's dealing damage on a multiplicative basis with cavalcade of calamity well the 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 cavalcade of calamity does that trigger on attack it says whenever a creature you control with power one or less attacks okay so it wouldn't get it off of the the one ones that are brought in by the summoner because it's they're they already tapped and attacking. 
However, if you have the city's blessing afterwards and you, you keep them, well then, yeah, now, now you're definitely talking huge swaths of damage that could be happening. Right. Interesting. Maybe I wasn't thinking that through, but it's still something, it's still something to consider yeah. in terms of one power creatures. Right. And you know what you also have? You have the, uh, the instant speed March of the multitudes, which produces a bunch of one, one life linkers. What about sapper links? Yeah. And cavalcade of calamity. What about just swinging in? I'm talking about a teamer deck here with Tetsuko where they are unblockable. We have more than one copy of this enchantment in play and we are going straight ham in terms of direct damage. Sure. It's fantastic. Yeah, that's gross. It, it really does pique my curiosity here. That is a card that I would suggest anybody look into because one one power creatures are generally extremely low to the ground, mm-hmm. right? And being able to produce some type of draw or create a crap load of tokens and just get out there and do that. And wow, March of the Multitudes is a nasty way to answer that. Uh, let me tell you, because in March of the Multitudes with Cavalcated Calamity and Naya, we've also got options for Sapperlings. We've got options for 1-1 one, one lifelinking vampire tokens through Legion's Landing. Mm-hmm. You've got options with yep. that. That card needs to see more play, and I bet you that it will. Yep. So the, the, the other enchantment I was talking about was High Alert. So it's one white and a blue, and it says creatures you, you control deal damage equal to their toughness instead of their power. And then defenders can attack as though they didn't have defender. Well, if you play something like that with Slaughter the Strong, well, you're playing a bunch of 0, 4, 0, 3, 0, 5 or more creatures. Well, Slaughter the Strong doesn't it cares about power, not toughness. So all of a sudden, you're, you're able to keep your entire board. Slaughter the Strong. And they have maybe, what, two creatures, if that. And you're able to swing in with, with like six creatures or something like that. And then imagine if you're running that still with um, Arcades himself. Well, he survives that. That's he, right. He's he a sure three does. five. That's right. So yeah, I, I think we could definitely have some fun things with that. All right, JB, do you have any honorable mentions? Uh, honorable mentions for me, uh, probably Spawn of Mayhem. Honestly, hasn't no, hasn't been seeing very much. He's right now. just kind of lackluster right now. I mm-hmm. know that you know the pro scene, the PPTQ scene, the RPTQ scene. Uh, certainly, Magic Online will probably find a way to break him or make him more reliable. Uh, but did not see, have not been seeing him much. Let's just say that. I, I think he's going to have a place. It's just, like you said, it's not there just yet. And and it's probably just because they haven't found the, found the right sequence of cards yet. But I'm sure it's there. We just aren't seeing it at the moment. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. We will see him. One that really piques my curiosity is uh, Verity Circle, right? Uh, that blue enchantment, I'd like to really figure out a way to break Verity Circle. It is two colorless and a blue for an enchantment whenever a creature an opponent controls becomes tapped. If it isn't being declared as an attacker, you may draw a card. And then also for four colorless and a blue, we can tap target creature without flying. Yeah, right? so, so we're playing something like Morpho Trickster or Sleep. Perfect. Um, or Perfect. Th- there's also a Merfolk that when it enters the battlefield, it taps a creature down and doesn't untap. Yep. Um, there's there's even a saga that does something like this that can even return those creatures to their hand. At that point, Tempest Collar is something really, really fun. Yeah, Time and time of Ice would be an incredible way to play mm-hmm. through Verity Circle. It just gives us more layers to a soft lock. Yep. Right? It's, a, it's an interesting card. And also, my final honorable mention before I kick it back to you to close us out here, Debo, is Essence Capture. Two blue counter targets creature spell. Put a plus one, plus one counter on up to one target creature you control. I see this... Uh, completely replacing Essence Scatter in the standard meta. I know that Essence Scatter is a little easier to cast, but Essence Capture is certainly going to make an impact uh, as a very powerful counterspell. Uh, I have a couple of honorable mentions myself, JB. So Wilderness Reclamation is a busted card. Absolutely. Nexus of Fate is proving that uh, Nexus of Fate needs to be banned. Yeah, so um, Wilderness Reclamation is three and a green, uh, for an enchantment that says at, at the beginning of your end step, untap all lands you control. So uh, imagine, if you will, you have seven mana and a wilderness reclamation in play. Uh, you've been leaving up your mana for counter control or something like that. Sure. And then on your main phase, your second main phase, you play an emergency powers for seven mana. You Each player shuffles their hand and graveyard into their library, then draws seven cards, exile emergency powers. It's yep. got an addendum clause. If you cast a spell during your main phase, you may put a permanent card with converted mana cost seven or less from your hand onto the battlefield. So you're drawing seven cards. I'm sure you're probably going to be finding uh, another uh, Wilderness Reclamation. So you play that down. So then I, at the beginning of your end step, you then have two triggers to untap your lands. So you then untap your lands. 
You then tap it for seven mana. You then untap your lands again. You can then tap it for seven mana. And if you and so now you have 14 mana to play with. So now you could play, like, I don't know, a couple of Nexus of Fates or uh, that you probably drew into because of emergency powers. Or maybe um, you could be playing something like Electro Dominance to then be able to, to dome them to the face for 12 and then put down a, a Nexus a, of Fate. A, a, a Nexus of Fate <laughs> after that. Right? So, like, yeah. that yeah. card is stupidly good. Yeah, it is. It needs to be a rare. Yeah, I'm surprised it's an uncommon. It needs to be a rare. Just the game-breaking stuff we've been seeing with Nexus of Fate, because when that lock goes off, it appears to just go and go and go, and you are sitting there uh, watching your opponent play Magic Solitaire. Hopefully it's you who's playing Magic Solitaire. And guess what else you could be running in that deck? Tell me. For one, you could be running a bunch of, of ramp spells to be able to get the lands out of your deck. Oh, yeah, of course. But two, you could be running something like Search for Ascanta, which then when it flips... You then get to untap it over and over and over again at your end step, getting more and more and more cards into your hand. That's correct. So, great. Yeah. <laughs> Finding the nexus of fate. Yep. You just get there faster. It's incredible, actually, how powerful Wilderness Reclamation is. Um, my my last um, my last card for the honorable mentions is the Mesmerizing Benthid. This card has got you excited. Yeah, I really like this card. Uh, three blue, blue, four, four, five uh, octopus. And it says when it enters a battlefield, you create two illusions uh, that are zero twos that have the ability of when they block a creature, that creature doesn't untap during its next untap step. Yeah. And then as long as you have an illusion, the mesmerizing Benthid has hexproof. Ixalan Jace has yeah. a place. So you, you play this along Ixalan Jace and it, Jace all of a sudden becomes great. Right, he just becomes amazing, amazing yeah, in this deck. He really does. Um, and then if you run with Murmuring Mystic, it, it produces the one-one bird illusions, and then you just run like quasi duplicate, which then if you quasi duplicate either the Benthid or the Murmuring Mystic, now all of a sudden you're 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 producing either a bunch of of birds or you're producing a bunch of zero two illusions and another four five. I really do challenge you to take this deck to Friday Night Magic next week. Okay. Uh, honestly, I would love to see that. I think it's going to be incredibly powerful. I know you've already got the Jaces. Mm -hmm. I've got the Murmuring Mystics. If you don't got them, I'm sure you already got them. Yeah. Uh, but picking up these mesmerizing uh, Benthids, you know, they're still very cost effective. The value hasn't been seen there yet. When we're talking about cards like Quasi Duplicate, when we're talking about specifically counter spells for the Murmuring Mystic, right? Being able to counter and interact and draw. Right. And and with the Jace, too, not to mention, it has that loot ability of whenever a creature deals damage to your opponent, you draw a card. Correct. Uh, I, I actually, it might be one or more creatures deals damage to your opponent, you can draw a card. But it, if Jace has his ability as ultimate as you produce more Jaces, um, then all of a sudden it starts stacking on each other where you're plussing up. Each attack allows you to draw two cards, then four cards, and, and you discard four cards. And right? we are finally getting to the point where it is possible for us to actually use his ultimate in game-ending ways. Yeah. Uh, it's a That's a very exciting prospect. Well, we've covered a lot today, Debo. Yeah, we have. I, I, I think, you know, we, we kind of started out with the, like the top 10 list, but then it kind of devolved into... Things we're excited Let's about. Let's call in it an evolve, not a devolve. <laughs> yeah, sure, evolve. What do you say? It evolved into things we're excited about in standard. Either way, a really good conversational podcast this time around. I think we covered a lot of really good grounds. Agreed. We, we covered a lot of really good combos. Uh, we talked about a lot of the things that are really interesting us. But either way, great episode today. It was good to see you as always, and can't wait to get the next one out there. That's right. So again, everybody, this is. Derek and JB over at LandsayGo.com and uh, you're listening to the main phase. We'll see you next time.